City of Tacoma Park. I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is our first event after our summer break, and we've got a lot of things coming up uh, over September. If you want to hear about our upcoming events, you can go to tacomaparkmd.gov backslash arts. There's also a link there where you can sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. And so now I'm going to hand things over to Mark Hendricks. He is a conservation photographer, a uh, former marine mammal biologist. He's written a book about uh, Assateague Island and uh, taken extensive photos throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which he's going to talk about tonight and show you some of his photos. So thanks again for coming, and I'll hand things to Mark. I like this. I haven't even done anything yet, and I'm already getting a round of applause. It's e I, I heard there were a few people in Tacoma Park that did not like football, so I'm glad <laughs> that some of you decided to show up today. This is no, this will be fun. Um, and luckily, since now I can see all of your faces, none of you. I don't think any of you have ever seen me give a presentation before. That's great because for you, these stories will be new. <laughs> and so, well. And as what Brendan said, I'm what's called, I refer to myself as a conservation photojournalist. So, and when most people hear that, they think I'm restoring old film <laughs> for museums. No, no, which is a, it would be a good idea. But what I do is I, pictures with a mission. Okay, I just don't take pictures for the sake of doing it or to raise my ego. I could care less about that. Uh, I like to tell stories, especially about endangered or rare species, especially in habitats that you live in right now that many people are not familiar with. So that's what we're going to go down. So imagine a place, okay? And this is happening right now. It's September. So for the next couple of weeks, in mountain meadows, the goldenrod's starting to bloom. And when that goldenrod starts to bloom, then the monarchs show up. And those monarchs, they're the feed on that goldenrod, so they can make their migration down to Mexico. Well, then in a few weeks from there, as that air gets crisp, the leaves are starting to change. Then we start to see that first glimpse of white in the air and the returning tundra swans start showing up on the tributaries around the Chesapeake Bay itself. And then a few weeks after that, those same swans have to deal with pretty harsh gale force winds on the Chesapeake. Okay? And what's fun about all that is that you're home. Okay? From that mountain meadow, you can get to that tributary of the bay in less than a work day. There's a lot of different ecosystems in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. More on that in just a bit, but a little bit about myself. I wasn't just found on the street today. And uh, I come from southwest Baltimore City. Okay? Um, I still wear those shorts occasionally, <laughs> and my mom forces me to. And when people hear that I'm from southwest Baltimore City, they think ur it's you know urban concrete jungle, and how did I get involved in this type of work? Well, my mom always forced me to be outside, get dirty, go to parks, enjoy myself, stare at bugs, and start learning to identify flowers and plants. And then from there, my love of wildlife and the outdoors then turned into wilderness and backpacking. And for then for t and 10 years, I worked at the National Aquarium. I uh, mostly I worked I worked with I, I, I did uh, I was an aquarist I worked with giant Pacific octopus but and I um, also but for most of my career I was worked in the marine mammal department where I um, had a lot of great moments uh, I trained these animals for a long time and that led to a lot of fun moments for me it also led to some absurd moments for me as well if anyone's interested in licensing that it's called Christmas card from hell. Um, and then well, with that I also was doing cognition research going to grad school and. Also, what I did is I did rescue work. Okay, so we did rescue and rehabilitation with cetaceans, which are the whales, the dolphins, and the porpoises, uh, pinnipeds, like this gray seal and this harp, harbor seal. And we also did uh, a lot of sea turtles as well. And I really, I really love doing that work. I love doing my research, and I love building bonds with everything from an octopus to a bottlenose dolphin. But I really like doing my rescue and rehabilitation work because it was, it was great to be able to give sometimes that animal another chance back out into the wild and giving that release. Um, so all that combined, and then while I was in grad school one day, I was writing an academic paper for my lab, and I started to get a brain freeze, like I drank a Slurpee too fast, and my head started to hurt really bad. And then I realized I was not enjoying what I was writing at all. Um, I realized I was only writing for a very small audience of peers, and for me, I wanted to try to pull heartstrings. I wanted to 
talk about things and write about things I cared about, and I wanted to reach a wide audience, not just a very small pedantic group. So I, was, I did journalism and took a course in journalism in high school, and I always took pictures, start with slide film. And I used to backpack and camp, I still, that's a big part of my work now, but I would backpack and camp and I would take a camera with me and take pictures to show people what I was seeing. Because people would always like, well, why, why do you go out in the woods for days on end? Well, I enjoy it, but look, look at all this amazing stuff that only happens when you're out there. So I was, I like to say I was uh, dumb enough to think I could start a career in conservation photojournalism, and luckily um, that's what I've been doing ever since. I do also teach courses in animal behavior and research methods at Towson University as an adjunct, but uh, most of my life now is being a, a conservation photojournalist. So doing stories on rare species we'll talk about later today, like the Delmarva fox squirrel, uh, piping plover, really cool animals that find sanctuary. And that theme is going to come up because sanctuary, it's not just the animals, it's for us as well. And a lot of my work involves the Chesapeake Bay watershed, but also the coastal bays, which we'll talk about where Assateague Island is found. And I like to, because I want to try to pull heartstrings, I want to try to show people things that I care about. Well, one of, that include, one of those things includes behavior modification. More and more people are going out into parks. More and more people are going into public lands. And with that comes really bad behavior. Like, this is lame. I mean, taking a Corona bottle and just putting it on a piece of driftwood is if someone purposely did that. It did not show up in a... I guess it could have happened, but very, there was no hurricanes at this time. And so that's just, that's lame. And people have to realize, you know, when you put something in the environment, the chances of it going out on its own are slim to none. So there was a group of guys on, uh, they live in Ocean City, Maryland, that got tired of the beaches being trashed. So, the guy in the car right there, his name's Alex, he started a group called Get Trashed on Assateague. And usually after a good day, they do go to the local pubs. But what they do is they go out and they, it was started with just a few guys, and they would go out and do beach cleanings. Okay? And what they're doing right now is that is an, a big fishing net that had become entrenched in the sand. We couldn't dig it out. So Alex, we had the idea to tie it to his front bumper and we pulled it out because it weighed over 100 pounds. Um, some of the work we do, little and they would do, is like this is five minutes of collecting mylar balloons that had landed on the beach, which is a huge problem. And from doing rescue work with pinnipeds and sea turtles, it's a big problem. You know, they land in the water, looks like a jellyfish. Easy snack, okay? Um, this is only five minutes, and we did a story for a publication called National Parks Travel on what these guys were doing. And then from there, as the article started making the rounds and it started being shared, uh, they went from three individuals going out on weekends to over 30 within two weeks. And now, there's, their group on Facebook is, I think, 200, over 200 strong now. And People plan outings and they go out, especially on weekends, and then during the summer as much, sorry, as they can, and they collect trash. And the stuff they collect is crazy, everything from tons of, there's an artificial reef off Ocean City, so tires are floating in all the time. But because of something like this, what they're doing and being able to get a story out, showing images, again, no one wants to see mylar balloons on a beach, but if people are more aware of these types of things, they might be more likely just to, hey, if you're on the beach and you see a can, or that somebody left a Corona bottle, they might be willing to at least pick it up. There's a trash can or recycling bin not far <laughs> from a parking lot. And they might just, just that little bit of change. And that's what I hope to do. If I can get most people to just consider giving something back to the environment, then I think I'm doing my job, okay? But photography for me has also been a gift in the way that's been my passport around the world. I also do travel and adventure stories for different publications. And whether that's you know, tropical nesting birds on remote islands or going out to the Serengeti by yourself for 30 days camping, well, my, but with my wife. So we put the two of us on our own in the Serengeti for a month and witnessing the wildebeest migration. But when you do these types of things, you do, you know, there's, you got to be a little careful. Um, but being out in the plains of Africa by yourself, is, it's a very exciting feeling. Um, your neighbors, you got to be careful about, but they start to get used to you. She, she stayed around with us for about three days, but you do have to be careful though, because sometimes Papa does show up, and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna stay in my tent uh, right now until you go to sleep, and then we'll get into our Land Rover. Um, but I also, with, with my work in Africa, 
there's, uh, this is called the mountain gorilla. All right, there's not many of them. So, okay, you guys are shaking your head. You guys are an enlightened crowd. Um, I like this. But the mountain gorilla, as you know, from most of it, it's, it's critically endangered. At one time, there were only about 100. Now we have almost 900 strong. Okay? But with mountain gorillas, they, Rwanda genocide, the Congo Civil War, they live in the Virunga region, which is only in uh, the DRC, uh, Rwanda, and Uganda. Okay? So they live in that region. And what goes on is ecotourism. Right? And guess what? If there was no ecotourism, these guys wouldn't still exist. So people pay top dollar to go out with a guide um, that with a, to see a certain troop of gorillas that become habituated to humans. They're protected by humans. They're called a group of anti-poachers. They are armed. And they, they know these individual families more probably than their own because they spend six days a week with them from sun up to sundown. And part of the money that goes into getting a permit to do gorilla tracking then goes on to create schools, environmental centers. So now it's placing value on the gorillas. Um, this is my friend Tony. Tony is an anti-poacher. He protects one individual family. He has a group that he goes out with, and uh, one family that he stays with, and he knows very well um, his life are protecting these gorillas. But it's not just the anti-poachers. Okay? This is Francois. Francois is a porter. People can pay 10 U.S. dollars a day to have someone like Francois carry their bags for them. Because some of the gorilla families, the mountain gorillas, are higher in elevation. So it it's quite a, quite a trek to get to. Um, but with Francois, his old job, he used to be a poacher. He was a part of the bushmeat trade. Now that there's value placed on the, this species, now the mountain gorilla is a revered species in Rwanda. And Uganda. there's still issues, especially with the rebel groups in DRC. But Again, we're now at home, we're getting closer to a thousand mountain gorillas that are still survive. But again, if it wasn't for ecotourism, we wouldn't have mountain mountain gorillas will be gone. And part of that has inspired me also with my work here and doing eco responsible ecotourism to show this wide variety of habitats that we call home in this Chesapeake Bay watershed. And the watershed's huge. Okay, it is the largest watershed in North America. It's also the third largest watershed in the entire world. It's big. 18 million of us call it home. Six states, it encompasses part of six states and all of DC. And then there's a wide range of, there's still pockets of wildness and a wide range of species. And some that can be found nowhere else. Most people, they, when they hear Chesapeake Bay, the only thing they think of is a bridge that gets them to Ocean City. But it's so much more than that because once you get over that bridge, I tell people, look up. Give yourself 10 minutes, because if you do that, you're probably going to see a bald eagle. A lot of people don't realize this, but specifically on the Delmarva Peninsula, but around the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, has the second highest concentration of nesting bald eagles, second to the Florida Everglades. This was still the case when they were an endangered species. The bay was a huge sanctuary for bald eagles. Now, you go over to Del Mar again, just look up. I promise you, if you give yourself, you might have to rest your neck with and get some ice on it, but if you look up long enough, you will find an eagle probably perched somewhere in <coughs> some loblolly pine or flyover. There's a lot of eagles that find, make their home here in the watershed. Um, but also, <laughs> there's some northern latitude species as well. You make your way up north, go into the Alleghenies, go up to more higher elevations, you can come across paper birch groves, one of my favorite trees. And people are like, they think Canada. Okay? But in some of the higher mountains in Pennsylvania, um, you can find cooler climates. You can find species like this, balsam fir, something thought of more like the Maine North Woods. There's pockets of balsam fir in the higher mountain elevations of the watershed. And in the watershed, also in the same state of Pennsylvania, they've reintroduced a large species that used to be found here. We'll talk more about that in a bit. And they've actually been reintroduced now for over 100 years, and that's elk. And also, it's home to species. We'll talk about this guy much later in the lecture, but stuff that's found nowhere else. They make their home only in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and they are a relic of a bygone era. Okay? But what links all of us together, from me, you guys, that salamander, that elk, all of the bald eagles, everything, it's water. So from those early spring rains to the Potomac River, right by here, 
those rapids at the Great Falls, everything's linked by water. So whether it's the fox hunting voles in a meadow near agriculture or white-tailed deer, and we're going to see more of those as the weeks and as fall starts to roll in as the rut begins, to the gray tree frog that decides to squat in your eastern bluebird feeder. Okay, all of these, they, all of us are linked by water, including the 18 million people that make their home in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So again, with my work, I want to show people, hey, this is what we have. There's still pockets of wildness, especially, you know, living in the D.C. area or the Baltimore, the Baltimore, Washington region. Most people don't think wilderness, but there are a few pockets of it not far from here. And we're starting to see more restoration in areas of the watershed that bring back the wildness. But people really have to realize restoration is expensive. Preservation of what you still have is a much more affordable way to go about conservation measures. But we are starting to see more restoration in different pockets of the watershed, especially around the bay itself. So for woodcock habitat, it's a game bird. They're not endangered, though their numbers have drastically declined in certain areas. Most people don't see them. They blend in really well with leaf cl clutter. They're a ground bird. They will fly, but not for very often. During the spring months, mom is not shy anymore, and they will use roads to cross with their chicks. It's if you want to have an enjoyable experience when you get home, go to YouTube and look up woodcock dance. There's a lot of, cre there's a lot of in creative woodcock enthusiasts who have linked their song with that old 80s song, Walk Like an Egyptian, because it's very similar. Um, it, it'll give you at least uh, 10 minutes of enjoyment. But um, so you got woodcocks. People, most people don't even know what a woodcock is. Or porcupines. Did you know porcupines? More northern species. Porcupines reach their southern limitation of their range in western Maryland. Okay? They used to be state endangered. Two years ago, they were, they were removed from state endangered. Uh, species. Uh, mostly found in Garrett and Allegheny, but they are growing more in Washington and Frederick. I've seen them in Frederick, and they're all over the mountains in Pennsylvania. Most people don't know we have porcupines in the state of Maryland, so close to the bay itself. And with that, with porcupines, at night they like to come out on the roads. Why? Because of salt. If you don't know porcupines are a species in Maryland, you're not going to be able to avoid them on the road. Um, again, Part of what I do with conservation photojournalism is it's not just about pretty pictures. Pretty pictures is for people that want to just share for likes on Facebook. That's a part of it, and that can inspire some people. But what I do is storytelling, and that includes I have to show the not so pretty, the, the ugly, the death. That's a part of it as well. And most people do not know that we have porcupines in this state. And I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple years from now one shows up in western Montgomery County. Okay. Eventually around Sugarloaf Mountain, there's going to be this ra random porcupine that shows up from Washington County or Frederick. But yeah, we have porcupines here. Well, again, thought of more northern species, Rocky Mountains. No, they, they're pe they make their home here in the watershed as well. But okay, again, not, not everything's bad. Water quality is increasing, which is excellent due to conservation measures. And really good news, and this is eelgrass. When you have healthy eelgrass beds, you see indicator species. And we just got good news from the state of Pennsylvania. They finally admitted that they have to do more with the Susquehanna River. We can do everything. Maryland, we, do, we already do a lot for bay cleanup and restoration. But remember, the watershed's huge. It's moving down the bay. So from north to south in Pennsylvania, if you have a lot of pollution, bad water, it's going to come into Maryland, and then it's going to make its way to the mouth of the bay. Right, so, but now Pennsylvania has admitted they need to do more. But we are certain, starting to see more flourishing eelgrass beds, the water of water is the quality is increasing. That is good. And when you see, have increasing water quality and healthy eelgrass beds, then you start to see indicator species, like this diamondback terrapin. Really cool species of turtle, thought to be the only turtle alive today that makes its home solely in brackish water. Also, crabs. Crabs are an indicator. Blue crabs are an indicator species. They're delicious, okay? But when you have a higher blue crab population, that's an indication that the water quality and its habitat is doing much better as well. And again, so all these things are linked by water. That's what makes the, the, all the, the tributaries and the rivers. And did you know in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, if you add the mileage of all of the streams and creeks and rivers, it comes out to be over 100,000 miles. That's more than all on the West Coast. 
Okay, it's a it's a watery environment from the mountains to the sh uh, to the marsh. But we're going to also talk about right now what's umbilically connected to the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and that's the Maryland Coastal Bays. And I spend a lot of time there. Um, that's also home to Assateague Island. Um, Assateague was perhaps, the, I believe, the first real public land that really, as a kid, uh, that's what stored, st that made me go this path. Okay, and everything, when people think of Assateague, they only think of one thing, though. They think of the wild horses. But what's cool about Assateague is it is one of the few remaining pristine barrier islands that exist. And a barrier island serves a very noble purpose. They exist because they absorb storm surges that would otherwise affect the mainland. Most barrier islands are either too small to sustain life, or they've been, the ones that are larger developed. Assateague is a pristine, we're not going to get into too much of the history, um, so we can get into everything, but this is the uh, topic of my first book that came out last year. And what I've always been fascinated by, what a barrier island, especially with Assateague, is the succession of habitats. One needs to thrive for the other to survive. So if you have a healthy beach, you can and it's long and, and it's wide enough, you can start to have dunes. If you have healthy dunes, then you start to get larger secondary dunes, which then plants start to grow. And then you can have maritime forest. So you have a forest on the barrier island. If you have a healthy forest, then you can get out into healthy marsh and then into the coastal base. And in each one of these ecosystems, there's specialty flora and fauna that that exist. And what's cool about Assateague, is especially if you're into birds, so if you go to one of the sh um, less wide areas, uh, well, Assateague at its widest is two miles, but at its um, thinnest, it's less than a quarter mile. And it's always changing. It's a barrier island subject to erosion and storm surges. So the island does change. Right now, it's about 37 miles long. And we'll see uh, how it goes. Sometimes it fluctuates between 36 and 37. But um, if you're a birder, Give yourself, you know, 20 minutes and try to go through all four ecosystems, and you can you'll see specialty birds in each one of those ecosystems. And what's cool about Assateague, again, it's a pristine barrier island, and it was saved from development, and it's a place where you can still see the night sky, okay, just like it was back then on those spring evenings and full moons in May when horseshoe crabs emerged to spawn, just like the Jurassic period, still going on, okay, happens at Assateague. But again, Assateague was saved from development. Um, there's three parks that make up Assateague. You have the Chincoteague Wildlife Refuge in Virginia and a part of Maryland. You have the State Park, 800 acres, Mar uh, Assateague Island State Park, and then Assateague Island National Seashore, which is the most of Maryland and the beach portion of Virginia. Okay. Um, Chincoteague was saved because of a uh, there was a dentist who was buying up the land. He didn't want he was kicking the fishermen out because he just not because he wanted to conserve it, he actually hurt their economy. He wanted the island to himself. Okay, but then when he died, his family gave it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife because snow geese population was decimated due to the hat trade then. And because they were an endangered, they, well, before the endangered species, they were almost an extinct animal. Now they're the second most populous goose. But they gave that land to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife because it was a snow geese sanctuary. And they still, now in a couple weeks, they'll be showing up by the thousands of snow geese. Um, then the Maryland State Park, again, there were, developers were buying up all chunks of Maryland. And then what they did is they gave 800 acres to the state because they knew they'd build a bridge. And that's how the bridge that gets you to Mar from the Ocean City to Assateague exists. So uh, then there was, a, they were, I mean, land was being purchased. There were 2,000 plots. And then the Ash Wednesday storm of 62 came in and, Decimate. And that's when the conservation measures really started to say this is not an, again, fairy islands serve a purpose to absorb storm surges. They're not meant for high rises. And so from there, um, this is evidence of the road. It was called Baltimore Boulevard. It was going to take you through to all the plots of uh, people that were buying property on Essex. So you can still see part of the road. Okay? But it was saved. And then from there, to, again, and then Johnson signed in the law in the 65 to make it a national seashore. But what's cool, again, with Astique, the wild horses are the most popular animal there, but they're not native, okay? And neither are these guys. There's another n exotic species found in the marshes of Astique and on the marshes of Delmarva itself. This is a small species of elk called the Sika. It came from East Asia, and apparently the way the, one, the Sika that came to Astatique, there were some Boy Scouts that had 13 of them where the roller coaster is now, on ocean, and that's, they had a pen for them. And then when um, they decided they 
for whatever reason, that it was going. They just let them go, and they swam across the causeway, and that's and they've been on Assateague ever since. Sika is S I K A, okay, and they they're they're colloquially called Sika deer, but they're actually a species of elk. Right? What's cool, but like their cousins in the Rocky Mountains and in Pennsylvania, they also bugle at night during their rutting season, and it's it, 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 but their rut lasts from November into January, February, really, and it. Very nocturnal. So if you're ever out in the marsh or on Ass Deacon on a cold January night, just listen. When you hear that banshee wail, it's not Halloween. It's, it's going to be a seek. And this is, whoa, that's really loud. OK, we'll stop that. Um, so, um, they, but there, there's the banshee wail. See, I, told, I tell the truth. Um, but yeah, that, that's what, so that's seek of males trying to let females know Come around. I'm I'm the big man. I'm the big stag on the island, and letting the other males know, don't mess with me. Okay. What's cool also about the marsh is now this is going to be starting very soon. We think of fall foliage, right? We go around, we look at trees. Well, on the marsh, there's a really cool plant called glasswort or saltwort. It's related to spinach. It's crunchy. It's delicious. It is edible. But late September, it turns scarlet red, and you can get patches of this plant in parts of the marsh. So now you have autumn color that you just look down. And, it's, it's a, and if you're lucky, you might see a Sika walk through it. And it's, or a wild horse, or might see some waterfowl flying. But it's a really cool autumn color. Um, moving into the forest, okay, maritime forest, you start to see the loblolly pines that tower over everything. This is where you'll see white-tailed deer. And then, because you have these towering white uh, loblolly pines that, that uh, prevent the salt spray, from getting on the ground, you start to see plants like blueberry, blue bush, blueberry bloom. This now allows certain mammals like raccoons and opossum and the deer, for, and for birds, provides a food source. So then you have others, and then you have the hunters. <laughs> so the apex predator of Assateague is the great horned owl, and they, there is a healthy population on that island. Moving into the dunes, there is a species that's been showing up more regularly the last couple years. It's the great horn's cousin. But it's not something you're always going to see on Assateek, but I've probably seen more people excited about Assateek due to, he for you Harry Potter fans, uh, but to see uh, snowy owls. Okay, the, there were a few last year, but the eruption of 2013 and 2014, there were so many snowy owls on the island, and a few have been coming back ever since. But last year, there were, I think there were three. Um, I saw two of them pretty close together. But this is also getting, snowy owls are a very majestic species. Like, a lot of people like snowy owls. That is an animal that might get people, they're, again, they're going to explore Astique in the winter months, which they would never have thought of to do before. But actually, Astique, to me, is the best in the winter months because there's no ticks or mosquitoes. Summer months, they can be absolutely brutal. But in the dunes, because that sand in the summer can get to 120 degrees, brutal desert-like temperatures, you see desert-like plants, such as prickly pear cactus. This is it in bloom in May. And on the dunes, just like that goldenrod we talked about at the beginning of the lecture in the mountain meadow, well, there's also seaside goldenrod. And guess what? Does the same thing. Okay? The other population on the Atlantic Flyway, just like the snow geese, these migrating monarch butterflies stop and ask to feed on the seaside goldenrod to feed their migration south. Same purpose. And what's cool about Assateague, is it's not, a, I always say it's a place you have to take your time. There's no big mountain vistas that are going to slap you in the face like the <laughs> Tetons. But there's still remarkable sightings. But you got to take your time. For example, I always look down, just like looking for the glasswort, because you might see the seaside grasshopper that blends in so intricately with the sand. And they hop all over the place. If you walk in the dunes for, nah, God, give yourself two minutes, you'll start to see them pop, hopping around. But then you got to look for them because they blend in very instantly. And, but again, it's this intricate beauty of nature. Um, also, on the dunes, when you have healthy dunes, you have healthy dune plants. Most dunes are, cons well, dunes are constructed by usually beach grass, sea oat, sea rice. And as again, Astic absorbs all that sand. The sand starts accumulating around the roots of this these uh, dune plants. This dune plant is a very special one. It's called sea beach amaranth. It's an endangered plant. Okay? It's unlike other dune plants, it's very sensitive. Okay? If you were to step on it, you could perhaps kill it. 
other dune plants do much better. They don't, these plants don't do well with competition. But they are very important to the early dunes. To get those large secondary dunes, you have to have the primary dune ecosystem. And that's where sea beach amaranth is very important. You see how it's got these shiny, waxy, almost Martian-like leaves? That's so it can absorb salt. And with on, uh, with, since it's an endangered plant, okay, I told you, if you step on it, or if you're in an oversand vehicle area and you're driving your Jeep, if you ran it over, you would kill it. So you, you put these fences over these to prevent from people from stepping on them. But it's not just the people. Okay? What's the most popular animal in Aspie? The wild horses. Left to their own device, they'll eat everything. And they eat sea beach amaranth. So more importantly is to protect them with that. Okay? Um, as the, uh, from North Carolina up to New York is where, uh, and up into parts of Massachusetts as well, is the range of sea beach amaranth. And certain, some of those states, though, it's no longer found. It was gone from Assateague for uh, decades, but it was rediscovered 20 years ago. Probably came from sea dispersal. And now we have a fairly decent population of it, but it has to be protected. People come to see the horses, but again, the horses have to be managed as well, because left to again non-native species, they would eat the island, and the deer would as well. They would eat the island every plant if left to their own. Okay, but also what's cool with that. There's another mammal that shows up that most people aren't aware of that we have here in the state of Maryland: seals. It's my background. Okay? And this is a harbor seal. And what's cool about this particular seal? They show in the winter. Usually December to February is the best time to see them. Usually young young seals migrating. They come here and they come to a pristine beach to rest. It's got excellent air, again, a pristine beach. They don't, they're not going to be disturbed. And then they can go out into the surf and hunt. So they come here in the winter months. What's cool about this particular seal is, like, for me, as a, with doing the wildlife, with doing wildlife photography as a part of my conservation work, it's really important for with my work that a wild animal accepts me into its presence. And this can take weeks. Usually it takes days, sometimes it takes a couple hours. But it's very important to be accepted into, and you, I would not disturb it and change its natural behavior. Um, because with that, then I can document the, wild, the truly wild behavior. But with the, that also comes with they accept you so much that they get bored with your presence and go to sleep. Now, this might not do well with my stock library. However, again, it felt comfortable enough with me that I decided to take a nap, and then I had to sit there for the rest of the day hoping that it would wake up and go into the surf and try to get some hunting shots. Uh, but when you have a, those healthy dunes and you have a healthy beach, and with the beach, you get shorebirds. Okay? These are American oyster catcher chick. These are lease terns. Lease terns are um, state threatened. Um, in parts of their range, they're considered endangered. They're not federally endangered, but their numbers have decreased in certain parts of their range. Uh, they have an interesting courtship behavior. The male presents the female with a fish, and if she decides to take it and enjoy set that meal of a fish, then they can, br they can breed for the next generation. Um, just ho hold off real quick, and I'll get to the, those questions at the end. And what's, there's another cool shorebird, though, that's very special to me, and I, I did an assignment on them, and to this day, they, they, they do pull my, my heartstrings. And you see these little eggs right here? And by little, I mean they're little. This is the uh, piping plover. Okay? And the piping plover is an uh, endangered species of shorebird. It's in, only in Maryland, it only nests on Assateague. And what's cool about piping plovers is that they, most people hear them before you see them. Okay, they have this, it's a peep low, very high and very fast. So you'll hear it, but you usually don't see them. They blend in really well. And again, just like the sea beach amaranth, piping plovers are sensitive. They need pristine beach to nest. And after World War II, as the Atlantic coast was getting more and more developed, there goes piping plover nesting areas, and along the Great Lakes as well. And also part of the, of with the beaches getting developed is vehicles. Okay? If you can see right here, these are tire tracks. Okay? This is an adult piping plover. It's going to be fine. Chicks, on the other hand, get easily caught in tire tracks. And from there, predators have easy access to them, or worse, uh, being run over. So if you've ever been on the beach around mid-Atlantic, Assateague, Delaware, New England, and you've seen so this type of contraption, that's protecting the piping plover. It's called an X-closure. All right, see, here's a fence. 
that's been, uh, that's been nailed into the ground. That's to prevent ground predators like raccoons, fox. And then they put mesh on top to prevent aerial predators, gulls and crows. Okay. Um, when a nest is located, it's a very meticulous process. It takes no more than eight to 10 minutes. They go in fast. And even before the, uh, the mesh goes on, wiping away, sweeping away the footprints. Okay, and I remember when I was out these, I was like, wow, I mean, they're, they're very fast. This, they're called the plover crew, very fast, got it done quick. And I was like, well, when does mom feel comfortable enough to come back? And it's pretty instant. She knows what to do. She's just, she's thinking about getting on her eggs. And she ducks under, goes in, and, and, to, and she'll sit on there until they hatch. And piping plovers, when they were listed as endangered, there were less than 800 breeding pairs on the Atlantic shelf. And to get them to be removed, they have, we have to get to 2,500 breeding pairs. And this was started in the late 80s. Well, guess what they're at now? Over 2,200. It's working. Okay? So eventually, the goal, you don't want piping plovers to be on the endangered species list forever. No, you want them to recover so that they can be removed. That's a success story. And again, we'll talk about that with another species as well coming up. Um, and then, because of that, we will have piping plovers continuing on the beaches of the Atlantic and Assateague, especially. It's the only place in Maryland where they nest. And I always say the chicks are little cotton balls with matchstick legs. Um, they're and they are adorable, but they are small. They're very fast, too. Um, I have been on beaches, too, where they have just, I'm carrying my gear, and they've just ran right over right in front of my shoe. I'm just like, whoa. And they're, I mean, they're very tiny, but uh, adorable. Uh, the mothers will also, if there's a, a predator around, they'll fake a broken wing display to try to get the predator to notice them. It gives the chicks ability to run away. It's really cool behavior to see. Um, what I like about also with Astique and the marshes of the Chesapeake Bay um, are the wading birds. Uh, my wife's uh, from Miami, so I, I love the Florida Everglades, and there's so many types of wading birds down there. And you can see huge concentrations of them right here, in this, and especially the marshy environments of the bay and on Assateague. Uh, one of the more fascinating wading birds that we have, though, is this punk rocker right here. This is called the cattle egret. Okay. Cattle egret has a really interesting natural history. Does anyone know where they came from? Africa. You got it. Yeah, they come from Africa. And for reasons we don't really understand, um, a couple decades ago, they, through natural range expansion, they flew across the Atlantic, ended up in South America, made their way up to the Caribbean and South Florida, then made their way up the Atlantic North and expanded westward. <laughs> Now they're everywhere. Um, so yeah, and what they do is they hang around pachyderms, like elephants and rhinos. They also see them around hippos and Cape buffalo. Because when those big hooves come down on that grass and all those bugs move out of the way, they're getting meals. And then when they get their meals, they, they don't have to use any energy. They can take a ride on that elephant and eat that grasshopper. And what's cool, unlike other places, cattle egrets have expanded in turn in their range. On Assateague, we can see the same behavior with the wild horses. They hang out underneath, they get free meal, they get easy meals, and they get a free ride. Um, so you can see it's very similar, but it's the same thing from Africa to Assateague. It's pretty cool to see, have been able to experience that in both continents. Now, there's nothing like a Chesapeake Bay sunset, especially, again, if you're looking out in the bay, that northern harrier flies by, you, st you hear the clapper rail, it's, uh, it's, 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 and it's those twilight colors, nothing like it. And especially now, those snow geese, like I told you, uh, on uh, an Astatique, they also show up all over. Well, you can find them anywhere, but you find a lot of them on the Delmarva Peninsula and the marshes of the Chesapeake Bay and the western Chesapeake in southern Maryland as well. And it's a cacophony of noise, and it's thousands upon thousands when they take off in unison. It's such an incredible sight. You don't have to go far to see an amazing wildlife encounter. You've got it right here at home in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. There's another white bird that's been uh, steadily expanding since 2005 now around the bay, and that's the white pelican. When you think of white pelicans in winter, you're thinking Florida, okay? But for some reason in 2005, some start showing up at Blackwater, and it's been growing every year, and they've been expanding out of Blackwater. So now, especially winter bird of the Chesapeake Bay is white pelicans. And again, this is only since 2005. Um, natural range expansion large 
And, and again, you can see them fly in like the swans. And so you'll have swans, snow geese, and big old white pelicans all around the same area. It's an incredible winter sight. Also, around the marshes of the bay, it's great, it's great for owls. A lot of people don't realize that. Barred owls. And then you can also get the ubiquitous welcome of the red-winged blackbird. That is the welcome to the marsh. You hear that? That's a red-winged blackbird male. And it's, it's always a welcome sign that spring is coming. Start hearing them around early March. Um, so you see them all around uh, the marshes. But there's another species that's especially bird. And that's called the brown-headed nuthatch. It reaches their northern terminus on the Delmarva Peninsula. And it's also found on Assateague. So around those loblowy pines, that maritime forest, adjacent to the marsh, is this really cool nuthatch. They are found from here, from Delmar Pinsa down to Florida, into part of the Bahamas, and uh, into the southeastern Loblowy pine forest. But because of the beetle infestation that the, from Asia that's killing the Loblowy pines, their numbers are drastically going down fast, because that, this is their habitat. They need mature Loblowy pine forests. In fact, you can even see this right on Assateague. And the Maryland side hasn't been affected so much, but the Virginia side it has. There's ghost forests. You don't see as many brown-headed nuthatches on Virginia as you do on the Maryland side. Um, but you can, once you, and really, you don't have to go far. You go across that bridge around Graysonville, there's some great loblolly pine forests <laughs> around the marsh. And this is especially bird, especially if there's birders that, you think of birds going to Florida, Arizona, attack South Texas. Well, they also come to Delmarva to get brown-headed nuthatches, especially for those people that are doing big years. One of these days, I'll be crazy enough to try. Um, also, again, seeker, you're not going to see them that very often, but also, you know, around the marshes of the bay and on Assateague itself are a great location for river otters. In fact, um, even when river otter populations were dropping so fast, Delmarva and the bay itself still had a healthy population, and many of those were trans relocated to areas of Appalachia. And now, there's why we have river otters in western Maryland and Pennsylvania. They came from the bay and it's to, to replenish numbers. Okay? But in those mature loblolly pine forests, uh, there's another species that is a specialty animal to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And that is a formerly, and I'm proud to say formerly endangered squirrel. They still keep these signs up though because you don't want people to run them over, or is the Delmarva fox squirrel. And the Delmarva fox squirrel, most people first see it, they just think it's a squirrel. And it is a squirrel, but it's not the gray squirrel that's attacking your bird feeder. Okay? The Delmarva five, they're large, yeah, they're large, about 30 inches, and 18 of that inches can be that a silver, coarse, bushy tail. They have beautiful fur. Now, why did the Delmarva fox squirrel become endangered to begin with? Well, at, they're more ground dwellers than gray squirrels. You know, gray squirrels stay mostly in trees. These guys stay in trees, too. They nest in trees, but they are mostly on the ground. Okay? So, with, the de with development in roads, many were lost due to collisions with automobiles. Okay. There's some anecdotal evidence saying that it was un uh, unregulated hunting, but it's mostly due to road, roads. That's why Delmarva fox squirrels became endangered. Okay, so well, how, well, what's the success story? Well, before they'd have to collect biological data on these guys when they were endangered, but now they've been um, removed from the endangered, they've been delisted. What happens is not, they're not out, out of the clear just yet. They still uh, monitor them for five years through a uh, monitoring program. And this goes with any species that gets delisted from the Endangered Species Act. But it's a lot easier now. Instead of collecting them to get biological data, now they can use, um, they still use the same trapping techniques to try to lure them in. But now you just use, you know, simple camera, tra trail camera from Cabela's. And, they, they, and then th through statistical analysis, they can estimate how, what the population probably is in that particular area, how likely it's to expand. What's the likelihood of other squirrels moving in through population dynamics? But how did these guys come back? Because Glenn Ferris of the DNR, who was very implement, he was a very, I mean, a big part of why these guys recovered. He said, if it wasn't due to private landowners, we could have saved them from extinction, but they wouldn't have recovered. They built relationships, good old boys on Delmarva, built who cared about the squirrel, who were not scientists, built relationships with the farmers built with landers where they allowed land that had been developed to cut to regrow because they Delmar Fox they like farms but they also like the loblolly pine forest so certain areas were allowed to replenish 
okay? And farmers were, were allowed them to be taken from the Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, where those eagles are, and brought, translocated to their land, just like those otters that went to Western Maryland from the bay. And guess what happened? Now the Delmar fox squirrel is being seen in areas it hasn't been seen in decades, generations, and they're going in areas they weren't seen, they, they didn't have uh, historical evidence of. And they're showing up, they're moving back into parts of Delaware as well. Historically, they're from New Jersey down to, uh, and all, down to m a lot of eastern Virginia. Okay? Now they're only found on the Del, um, Delmarva Peninsula on the eastern shore, but they are expanding their range into higher elevation because the Blackwater Refuge, it's estimated as sea level rises, a lot, most of Blackwater is going, that we, as we know it today, is going to be much different. But they're not concerned about the squirrels being removed from the endangered species list because they're, they're being so successful at moving and they're replenishing the whole peninsula. And this is a specialty animal that makes its home in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Most, 90% of them are in the state of Maryland, can be found nowhere else. And, and, and when you see one, and they are, they are so silver, I mean, they, they are a squirrel that I will always say that is just gorgeous. They are a gorgeous squirrel. So if you haven't seen one, I encourage you to go out and try to find one. Um, now, now we're going to make what I've been spending a lot of my time in lately for especially my next book project. We're going to make our way from the Potomac and the Piedmont, where we are now. We're going to make our way west into Appalachia, where the vast majority of the watershed is. Okay? And in that, in Appalachia, you see a, lots of interesting things that you do not think of when you think Chesapeake Bay, such as red spruce forest and blueberry and huckleberry fields that stretch for miles. This is part of Virginia, West Virginia, okay? specifically around the Dolly Sods, right on the Eastern Continental Divide. That water flows into Potomac, flows into the bay. Okay, so this is an area with windswept sandstone. Okay, it's a beautiful area. Get there in less than a work day. Okay, and that same water that's coming from the Potomac right here starts out there in West, good old West Virginia. And it is beautiful. And uh, so you see these plants. Again, you think red spruce, you think huckleberry, you think sphagnum moss. You're thinking more, much more northern. And it is an interesting climate. Okay? The, it traps cold air, this, this area of West Virginia, from Canada. Then with the warm air rising from the Potomac, it creates a very volatile climate. They get snow from late September into May. Um, if you, uh, to get there in wintertime, you pretty much have to ski out to there. there are, I've seen cars that people have had to leave in late October, early November because the snows came and they had to wait <laughs> for it to melt because they get a lot of snow. But it is a stunning environment. All that water flows right to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, also in the mountains, I told you Pennsylvania reintroduced elk in 1913. Yeah, um, we used to have a lot of species here that were extirpated, okay? Elk, we had uh, mountain lion, timber wolf, okay? wood bison, all relics of a bygone era, no longer found. But the last uh, ha haven for the eastern elk was in central Pennsylvania in the Alleghenies, part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And it was there where they decided to reintroduce them. So in a couple weeks, their rut will start. Uh, and you hear those beautiful bu bugles, but yeah, you don't have to go to Yellowstone to see elk. You can go to central Pennsylvania, small mountain town. And their economy is based on now, because it's gotten so popular, people to come see the elk herd. Okay? Um, the area of Benazet's a very easy, you know, pretty much if you don't see elk, it's because you're sleeping. Okay? <laughs> there's a lot of elk in that town, but there's also some other, uh, it's called the Pennsylvania Wilds region, uh, the Quahana Wild area is really, if you want to go out and see old school Appalachian wilderness, and if you find the elk that aren't used to people, that's an adventure. It's a great backpacking and camping trip. But yeah, so there are still pockets of the Chesapeake Bay Marshall, but we still have these large mammals that are, you know, were used to be plentiful in the entire watershed. Um, but let's, uh, and then we'll get, so we have the Alleghenies, but we also have the Blue Ridge. And we don't have to go far from here, right here in Tacoma Park to get to the Blue Ridge. Just head up to Frederick, okay? And in the Blue Ridge, there's a lot of species that you can be encountered, just like the Alleghenies, but and that includes the white-tailed deer. You know, the ruts come, but in the spring months, you know, plentiful. I mean, we can we can find them all over the watershed. But there's so many deer in the Blue Ridge, 
And again, this will be coming in a couple weeks. So, you know, just I always tell people, just be careful because when those males are going, what, what boys will do for girls' attention um, knows no bounds. So that's why there's so many collisions in autumn with deer because the rut. So they're going, females are being chased, the males are going crazy, and they don't care about a car. Um, so take it slow, especially on some of these darker roads, even not far from here, some near the nature centers. There's a, there is a high deer population. But the Blue Ridge, there's tons of white-tailed deer. Um, it's also a, a haven for black bear well, and this is a very special, this particular bear is very special to me. I've been watching her for years. I call her Super Mama. I know where she dens. I've seen her now rear uh, two sets of cubs, and she just kicked out. It's very sad, because now that they have to, I won't see them together anymore, but she, and they all survived. We're the three brothers, and I'm one of three brothers. <laughs> So uh, my mom actually has this picture on her wall because she, I don't know what that says about me, but uh, I guess she thinks I'm a bear uh, to an extent. Uh, I wish I could get a mustache like that, but that's another story. Uh, but yeah, so the, we have a, you know, a very healthy black bear population in the Blue Ridge Mountains, especially yeah, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, even Cooperstown, New York, around that area. It's a black bear haven. And there's also um, lots of caves. In, App um, in Appalachia. One of the things I'm working on right now with biologists is uh, studying white nose syndrome. And what you're seeing with uh, some of these caves is a very high mortality rate uh, with bats, almost you know, in some cases 100%. Um, white nose syndrome came from Europe, and in Europe, you know, there's caves that are like the most beautiful caves in the world, but there's no bats. And, and now we're starting to see where white nose syndrome has come in Maryland, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. And now, across to Washington State, because all it takes is a spelunker gets on their clothes, and that's how it travels. And, and uh, you know, certain, certain bat populations are getting decimated uh, that live in these areas. So this is a project I'm working on right now. Hopefully we'll see publication in the next uh, year or so. Whoops. Um, but yes, but we, you know, lots of cool caves, lot, bats and bat species. Um, there's another species that makes their uh, home in the watershed that it's state threatened and it lives in the, Pla the, the Appalachian Plateau in those Allegheny Mountains. And it's a, a, just like that um, Delmarva fox squirrel, it's a rodent and it is the Allegheny wood rat. And this is also, a, I'm working with scientists right now uh, documenting their work and hopefully this will be a story that comes out eventually. And um, people are afraid of rodents. People think of rats like, ah, well, the Allegheny wood rat's clean. They are, they keep a very, they are constantly cleaning their little area. It's not big. I mean, we're talking about an Allegheny wood rat's home, <laughs> like here. Okay, Not very far. They keep it very clean. They move stuff. And they have these long whiskers, and they live in these rocky outcrops. And they can be found in parts of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, even Indiana. But in most of their range, they've decreased significantly, mostly due to gypsy moth infestation because it kills the forest habitat. Um, but as the, you know, when you have a healthy environment and those plants are allowed to regrow, it helps with the population. And what's really interesting, you got to be careful <laughs> in Allegheny wood rat habitat in Appalachia is for some reason they live harmoniously with these guys, timber rattlesnakes. The same outcrops uh, where you find w Allegheny wood rats, you're very likely to find timber rattles. And they'll let you know, like this one, that they notice you. Okay, um, but timber rattles, even they, they, in certain areas, in certain states, they are uh, state endangered. Um, and a lot of it due to uh, poaching efforts on the black market. Timber rattles go for quite a bit on the, on the black market. Uh, yeah, people go and try to collect venomous snakes and then sell them to drug dealers and other uh, nefarious people. But true, that's, uh, and also state bounties have also, you know, caught people that get paid to go out and just kill a bunch of timber rats. But, you know, Allegheny wood rats are great. But you know what? They don't really, they seem to live harmoniously with these timber rats. But you know what these guys eat? The other animal, the other rats that you don't want around your home. Um, so they preserve a very important niche in the environment. Okay? It's also a place where he's fur bears, bobcats. Doesn't happen very, I spent a morning with this bobcat. It's very lucky. Uh, I, I don't know if it'll ever happen again. I hope so. Um, but yeah, that's the only, we don't have mountain lions anymore. There's some people swear they've seen them, but usually what they see is a bobcat. Remember, a bobcat does not have a long golden tail. They have a bobtail. Okay? 
Uh, but yeah, we have, we have bobcats all over the App Appalachian Mountains. Whoops. And uh, we used to have timber wolves, not anymore. But something else has moved in, and that's the eastern coyote. And actually, Montgomery County has got a very healthy population of them. But um, in certain areas, they have been seen to dramatically reduce deer herds, just like because they prey on the fawns. They don't, some of them have been, there is anecdotal evidence, and people have seen them chase. A uh, buddy might actually video to chase an adult deer in Pennsylvania. So they, I think the bigger ones will go after, but um, you know, back in the day when we had timber wolves and mountain lions, that's what kept the deer population in check. Well, we don't have those large pairs, but it's going to be interesting to see as these guys expand more uh, what the ecological niche is going to be. Most, they mostly eat small mammals, but uh, they are being seen more and more regularly. But with fur bears, work on my Appalachian project right now, I've always fantasized, you know, if I could go back and live in any area, because I've done projects on primitive survival and bushcraft for Outdoor Life magazine, and I've been trained in those things. I would always, if I could go back in time to any area, I would like to be a mountain man uh, for at least a day. Uh, and, then, and then I, I would, you know, I'd like to, um, you know, have some slippers at night. But um, I think it'd be cool. So, you know, the, the mountain men were, they were big fur trappers, okay? And well, we're not going to get into the, the tra fur trapping, but what I'm doing now it's pretty fast. I'm, I'm doing camera trapping. And what I'm doing is I'm taking retired cameras I'm not really using anymore, hacking cables, I'm modifying cases, and I'm putting them out in wilderness locations or private land that borders wilderness locations. And, uh, I, set, and I cook them up to an infrared sensor, and it's like a studio in the wild. And I and hear some flashes that I've of uh, camo duct tape that I've put in food contained in bears because uh, for some reason bears will destroy them. Um, but I'm trying to get more of the nocturnal species that you're not going to encounter, uh, li very likely at all. Um, but, you know, most of the time you fail. But when you get something, it's like Christmas morning. It's, it's very exciting. Um, like a possum. Uh, if it wasn't for possum and uh, raccoons, uh, I wouldn't get really anything. But, it's allow again, it's allowing me to get images that I wouldn't be able to get any other way. It gives this wide angle, personal perspective, more intimate, shows the animal in their environment. And you know, I find game trails, I look for signs, just like a, an old mountain man would, and that's how I set my camera traps. Um, funny story though, uh, like I said, if, if it wasn't for possums and raccoons, and I love possums, because a lot of people think of possums, they think rats, but they're not, they're a marsupial. They eat ticks, they serve a very important ecological niche. Um, but uh, raccoons, if it wasn't problems with raccoons, I pretty much wouldn't have much of a success rate with my camera trapping. But this raccoon, this particular raccoon, paid my camera trap a visit for three straight nights and became very fascinated unnaturally with my camera trap. And so um, I had a full memory card of this. And I, I showed up and I was like, what, what's wrong? What happened to my camera trap? It was all off center and hanging. I was like, what the? So I, I take it down. I'm, going through the images at home because the battery at this point had been, it was dead. And I see it, there's this raccoon. It's, I've got hundreds of images of this raccoon. And then on the second night, it was become really fixed. Like, what the heck is this thing? It, and it would keep triggering. It, was, I, it would go back and forth on the infrared sensor. I was playing with it. And then I have like 80 pictures of this. It came up to the camera trap itself and just sat there fascinated by this, uh, this thing, whatever, that it had no idea what it was. And then I found out how my camera trap had become off-center. Um, it climbed on it and just, I don't know what it did at that point. It might have, uh, it was the mating season, who knows. But he did, uh, he knocked my camera trap over. So that raccoon gave me about like 600 pictures and about half of them are this. Uh, so, but yeah, so that was funny. But you know, sometimes you get lucky. Again, it's all, I mean, you gotta, you plan, but, and, but most time things don't happen. You know, you get a red fox shows up now and then, that's right. But um, also in the same, same game trail, got a gray fox. I don't see gray fox very often, more nocturnal. They're the only canine species that actually climbs trees. Pretty interesting, a really cool animal. Um, <coughs> so there's other species that I'm trying to capture right now with my, my, Appal my ongoing Appalachian project. There are fishers uh, and also mink. Um, and if I can get otter and beaver too at night, you know, I've seen plenty of them, but you know, I'm trying to document the biodiversity of Appalachia right now, because that's an area I think 
uh, needs more cred and needs and it and it's a wonderful, beautiful place and it has a lot of pockets of really good wilderness reading. A lot of people don't realize that. So I want people to appreciate what we have in Appalachia. And there's a lot of cool spots not far from here. Um, but the animal I want to talk to you about right now, real quick, in Appalachia is this guy. This is a special Appalachian wonder. This is called the Shenandoah salamander. And it is believed to have the smallest range of any tetrapod today, living today. It's a relic of the Pleistocene. Okay, the fact that we still have Shenandoah salamanders is remarkable. They only live on the three highest peaks in Shenandoah National Park. Shenandoah National Park is our big national park in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And when you think of salamanders, you think of logs and rocks by creeks. These guys, high elevation, cool, dry climate, and they live on the outskirts of Talus Slope. Tal this is Talus Slope. So they live on the outskirts. And this is a very, and again, up here you see more northern plants like red spruce and balsam fir. So during the Pleistocene, these mountains were more coniferous as opposed to deciduous. Okay. Um, they are an endangered species due to their very small range. And for the longest time, um, it's been theorized the reason they were endangered was because of a much more common salamander, the eastern redback. So scientists, especially with the G U.S. Geological Survey, they do n the, the, the salamanders are nocturnal. They come out at night. And you go out trying to survey them, and one of the survey methods is using a tape measure and then walking the length of that tape measure on steep, rocky climb, uh, like a steep, rocky area, and you try to count as many, and it document, well, any salamander you find, but you're specifically looking for Shenandoahs. Um, and here's one on, at night on, it, hanging out in the moss. And they have a, the striped phase, and they also have this uh, black phase as well. Um, this guy is the much more common. You can probably find these outside here right now, the eastern redback. Eastern redback is a much more successful species. They've, been ex they've expanded their range up the mountain. They used to stay in the lower elevations. Well, they've expanded into the higher elevations as well. It was always theorized that these guys were the reason they were they're just much more successful. They display Shenandoah salamanders. But actually what's going on with these guys is more of the climate. Okay, what's going on with Shenandoah salamanders and the big run. They did a uh, study in a, in, a, in a lab, and what they did is they created uh, four potential hypotheses what the cl climate could change. If it's cool and dry, so we have humid and wet, and what could happen with climate change. And what Shenandoah is just, they don't eat. They get weaker. Okay? While the eastern redbacks that were in the same enclosures, they were fine. Okay, so again, this, they're, well, they're, again, they're a relic of the Pleistocene. Okay, much of a very a different climate. The fact that we still have them is remarkable. But even though they're protected completely in sh the boundaries of these three mountains in Shenandoah National Park, the outside influence of bad air quality and pollution is something that knows no boundaries. And okay, so will we have Shenandoah salamanders? I hope so. And they, their population is still good for what it is. Again, they're not gonna, they can't live really anywhere else. But if, it do, if that area do, it gets more wet, gets more humid, their days would be numbered. And this is a very rare species that's only found in Shenandoah National Park, but in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So in closing, I just want to tell people, I always try to convey, like, we're very lucky to have, even though you don't think that, we don't have Yellowstone, we don't have the Tetons, we don't have Yosemite. But we have a lot of special areas in Appalachia, in the Piedmont, in the marsh, we have, and then connect it to the coast bays. We have Aztec. There's so much cool areas in the Chesapeake Bay water and, and wonderful species that a lot of people don't realize or don't appreciate. They don't realize what we have. And the only way we're going to be able to keep it that way is if we, one, support these places. And, you know, you, the old adage, you know, leave only your footprints behind, take photographs, take video have fun with it, okay? That's how this is, because again, 18 million people, and more and more people, due to the economic uh, quality of this region, more people are moving in all the time, every day. So we share this home with these, all these different species. Um, so on that note, I want to close. Um, I do have um, a book, my first book, Natural Wonders of Astique Island, is available now everywhere. If anyone's interested, I do have a limited amount of copies. Uh, my wife 
she was like, we just moved, and she's like, I need you to get rid of some of these. Uh, so it's been very, well. it just won its first award a few weeks ago, so that was very, I was like, how'd that happen? So that was very exciting. So you know, I'll be, uh, and you can always keep up with what I'm doing, my website. I don't really, I suck with social media, but I try. And, uh, but I am on Facebook and Instagram. I'm more busy doing my projects than <laughs> putting stuff online. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can keep track, because again, I'm working on my second book. I hope I have a couple stories in the works around. I've got three features coming out in the next year, and I'm always looking for other avenues to try to, because I'm a freelancer. I do all this myself. And um, uh, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, I'm here. Uh, thank you for coming. I know, again, uh, football night, back to school. And you guys really care about Shenandoah Salamanders, so aces to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, this is cool. And it, this is great. I like these intimate crowds because uh, I can see when you're on your phone. No, just kidding. Uh, no, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Okay, so they're only going to be found on the outskirts of the talus slopes on three mountains. Yeah. On top of that, compared to the eastern redback, their dorsal stripe is much, is orange, much more orange than red and thinner. Okay. It's about a third, as an eastern redback is more like two-thirds. Also, if you see their ventral side of their belly, they are much more mottled, so more uniformly black with a few specks of white, while uh, eastern redback is salt and pepper completely. So they are a little bit larger too, but again, <laughs> that's going to be very hard to discern. Yeah. Hey, sorry to keep you waiting about no, that. That's okay. I changed my topic. Oh, that's fine. Um, the tree frogs. I moved to uh, an apartment complex about four and a half years ago uh -huh. by the Glenmont Metro, and mm -hmm. there's woods, and I'd hear these things at night go, <laughs> and they're in. Hear them in trees. Yeah, it could be I that. never yeah. saw yeah. them, but I was told they were tree frogs. Yeah, there's green and gray. Yeah, mm. yeah, they, they can find them anywhere. And are they unique to Merlin? East? No, you can find them in all all over the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Ah, so and, mo and a lot of the east. It's a Chesapeake Bay um, watershed species then. And it's found outside the watershed as okay. well. It's a pretty. Pl it's they're both plentiful. But I, east of the I've never seen the animal, but I was told they're probably tree yeah, frogs. Yeah, I mean, they are going to be hard. They're going to be more active at night. Um, right, early summer in the evening. You guys, I found gray tree frogs on just at night. Like, go look at buildings. And I've seen them just, like, stuck there. I've only heard of tree frogs that they were in the tropical rainforest. I didn't know they were up here. Oh, you know, there's, there's temperate. And, yeah. uh, that's another thing just about Appalachia is the most biodiverse region in the world for um, amphibians, specifically salamanders. Okay? Not the tropics. A lot of people don't realize that. So we have, a, a, especially in the Great Smokies, which is not in the watershed, but in Appalachia, in Maryland, in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of uh, diver biodiversity in regarding the salamanders. It's awesome. Hey, Mark. Um it, it seemed like when you were talking about Astig, you, you kept talking about how great it is in the, in the winter, yeah. and I wouldn't have occurred to me. Can you talk a little bit more about <laughs> what that's it, like? It is so great in the winter and the fall. Why? There's no ticks, there's no mosquitoes, and there's hardly any people. You can have the whole island to yourself, and you can really take your time, and you'll meet more hardy people like yourself going out there in the wintertime. And you know they're, because they're, you know, in, the, in the summer months, one of the mosquitoes, I mean, if there's anything that finds me tasty are mosquitoes, I mean, they just destroy me. Um, and you, but with that, you get really big crowds. And I don't know if you know what's going on. There's another horse just died this year. It was, a, it was actually, unfortunately, it's in the, it was a horse that was born two years ago. It's actually in my book. And it was hit by a car and had to be humanely euthanized last week. Um, last year, there was a horse, um, a camper, felt sorry for it. So it put out dog food to feed it. And it can't digest, ruptured the bowel. Um, another one was hit by a car as well. So, again, that, a part of my ASTIC work is trying to, you know, Hey, you know, they're still wild animals. The winter time, you don't, that doesn't happen, because no one's there. You know, the people that are going there in fall and winter, um, they're really going there for nature study or looking for snowy owls or seals. Um, and it's also just a, it's quiet. It's really quiet. Um, you can hear your heartbeat sometimes. Um, it's just a really, it's a much more interesting way to go out and, and study acetique. And it, early spring's good too, before the mosquitoes hatch. But when the crowds come, it is uh, it can be very difficult <laughs> because I mean I mean acetique I mean acetique is also very important to the economy though 
I mean, I know I'm saying that these seasons are better, but in the summer, I mean, so much of economic benefit comes from people that go to Assateague. Assateague gets two and a half million visitors a year now. That's almost Whoa. Yellowstone. Yellowstone's around three. So Assateague gets more visitation than some of the big, na of the actual 59 national parks. It's getting more and more popular. So part of my work, especially with these warrants, to sh show people what we have, but how to also behave properly as well, just like with the get trashed with Assateague. But fall and winter, and you just, it's a, you can really take your time. It's nice, and fall's great too, because it's still not, it's not really cold, so you don't get those gale force winds on the beach. But you get, you get some fall, you get the fall foliage of the, of the marsh and the, the, um, the trees as well. But it's, uh, it's just such a different experience when you're not that many people. And if you go to around Virginia, Chincoteague, you get to meet the locals. They are the saltwater cowboys that do the horse roundup every year. It's, it's, you can take your time more. You get to really take in the culture as well. It's hard to do that with the summer when everything's so busy. And, uh, you know, it, it's just a different time. But, again, for me, most important, though, those ticks and mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. If I can avoid them, I will. I was going to ask you the same question about um, black. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask you the same question about Blackwater. I've only ever been there in the early spring. Okay. But what, what time of year would you recommend and what particular things besides the bald eagles? Well, Blackwater is great all seasons. I mean, I prefer the less humid. Um, but Blackwater isn't aesthetic. You're not getting that type of visitation. So any season you can, but like again, the, again, the ticks around Blackwater are also really, really, really bad in the warm months. I, I like I like fall and winter because I guess you know, the tundra swans are coming in. That's when you can see those snow geese take off thousands upon thousands at the same time in unison. It's such a sight to see now with the pelicans. It's a, and, you, and also, you're more likely, especially if you're in the lo, not in the Loblaw Pines, but in the deciduous area, in winter, you're more likely to see owls. And especially in January, there's a healthy population of great horns at uh, Blackwater. So besides also the waterfowl that's there, which is awesome, but you, the great horns, they take over old hawk and eagle nests. So January is their breeding season. So that's when they're going to be most active. So January and February, you're going to make your way around, and you, if you try hard enough, you, eventually you probably will find some great horns. I've seen two that were courting at Blackwater in uh, January one time. It was re really re remarkable. Um, but I, I do like the, uh, the cooler climate, especially now that I've, I'm doing the camera trapping in Appalachia. Um, that's when uh, things are on the move because they ha they have to, if they're not hibernating, they have to find something to eat. So they're, they're, they're definitely moving around. And also, again, you don't have all that leaf foliage that gets in the way you can spot things more. So yeah, I, I, I am more, definitely gotten more in the fall into up to early spring are my favorite times to get out especially when I'm camping or backpacking. I think you've answered part of my question, mm -hmm. which we were, we were in Assateague about 12, 13 years ago, around Thanksgiving. So we decided to have one Thanksgiving there yeah. with the family. And we saw, and that was my question, I think it's snow geese, that yeah. you go to that pond between, from the, towards the beach. Yeah, yeah. And you're going there on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. Thousands and yeah. thousands of these birds, and sometimes there are, there are, it's like an airport. One one party is up there, and the other the is landing, in. and yeah. they come in and they are circulating for some space to clear up. And yeah. with some signal, this whole group on this side takes off, and that's an amazing, amazing. And moment. I like how you said that so nicely because it's such an incredible wildlife encounter to see that snow geese spectacle. You don't have to go far to see it. It's a, you live you live in the watershed. You get there in a few hours. You get there, you know, in le less than half a work day in some of the locations mm -hmm. where they are. But if you want to see that, Blackwater and Asti are two of the best areas to really experience it. You can find it also around Calvert County in the agriculture areas too. But man, when you're on that marsh, bordering the bay itself, that it is one of the greatest wildlife spectacles, and it's right here, right here. And I've seen the wildebeest migration. It's amazing. Seen the Mar River cross. That snow geese spectacle is still up there. It's still one of my favorite that I look forward to it every winter. It's incredible. You know, and, and, and that's why you from you know, becoming a conservation photojournalist, I, I mean you you appreciate what you have. You just it's just because you're out there and you're experiencing and it's like, wow, I'm not I'm home. <laughs> that's so cool, I'm home. 
and I'm, I'm experiencing this, and I'm not at some faraway exotic land. I can do it in my, in my home watershed. It's so cool. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm curious. I think it's still, yeah, there we go. Um, where do you want to go that you haven't, that you haven't been, or, or you've been a little bit, but you, you, you want to go yeah. back? And it could be in the watershed, or it could be. I've been spending a lot of time I just got back uh, from the Allegheny National Forest. I'm doing a project with the National Forest Foundation on synchronous fireflies. And most people, synchronous fireflies were only found in the Smoky Mountains, but population five years ago was found in the Allegheny. It's like a Christmas lights display in Hemlock Forest. You, you drool on yourself. The males sink, and they flash the impress the girls. It's, it's, it's an it's a amazing display. Um, so I, I, I'm really in a firefly kick right now, and I want to see other species of fireflies. But uh, my wife and I were just talking about this. Um, She's Colombian, so she's been to the Amazon. She has family that live in Medellin, so she's been to the Amazon. I've never been to the Amazon. I've never been to Alaska either. So I, I would really like to get up to um, northern, uh, like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, I'm really into boreal forest. Um, northern Maine, Canada, spruce fir forest. I, um, I love bobcats. But one animal that I would love to encounter, because I, I feel like my luck had changed when I spent that morning with that bobcat in the woods. We were together for about a half hour as I, I, I tracked it and followed it through, and she was very comfortable with my presence. I would love to see a Canada lynx. I think they're just such cool cats. So um, I, I really like boreal forests. So, but Alaska has a lot of lynx. In fact, I know someone who was just there a couple weeks ago, and they saw three. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I guess so. I, I would like to get up to. Uh, the tundra of Alaska. These places you mentioned, I think, have a lot of flies, which seems to be an issue for you. Oh my God! Yeah, that's the thing. Like all these, yeah, the, the 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 flies and the mosquitoes, and oh, and like especially like in Africa, those tsetse flies are no joke. I thought the flies on the beaches here bit hard. I've never been bit by a bug like that. Um, you know, you have to be inoculated before you go, but they leave marks, and uh, woo, they get. That's why when they get in your. Uh, they get in your tent, you're doing everything you can to get them out. Um, because in Africa, when you're camping, I guarantee you there is a lion or a hyena not far from your campsite. Um, that was every night. We had elephants that came and sniffed us in our tent. So we had to be very careful about those teeth. We learned fast after the first couple nights, uh, my wife and I, when those tsetse flies, uh, <laughs> they, they, they attack you. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing. With the, a lot of these great areas, you have no choice, but you have to accept the, the, the nasty parts, the ticks and the mosquitoes. It's, it's the natural world, you know, it's just kind of how it is. But uh, you just have to, you know, prepare yourself. I'll, eventually I'll start wearing more hazmat suits so I can avoid uh, the, the, those, those darn mosquitoes. Because what, oh, I look like I have the chicken pox sometimes and they get me so bad. We have a, we've got time for one, one more uh, question, if anyone. Okay, well, um, I'm, uh, I'm Kevin Adler, a member of, of uh, the We Are Tacoma group also, and, and thanks for coming. Uh, we've got a lot of programming coming up, including a, um, an, an exhibition next Thursday, the next one of the monthly, you know how they're in the, the atrium and so on, and it's about street art, so it, it, should, be, it should be pretty good. There's uh, photos, but then there's also uh, signs and other stuff, and it'll be a lot of fun. Of course, Tacoma Park Folk Festival is, is a week from Sunday, uh, the 16th, so there's a lot, of, a lot of great things going on, and we hope, hope everybody can join us. And the first poetry reading is...